Hello, everyone. I'm Doug Elmendorf, Dean of Harvard Kennedy School, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this year's Robert McNamara Lecture on War and Peace. We're fortunate to be joined today by Craig McNamara and Mark Pastor, uh, children of Robert McNamara, and we are grateful for the support of the McNamara family for this important lecture series. I want to begin by offering my heartfelt sympathy to everyone joining us who is from Ukraine or who has family or friends in Ukraine. As I wrote to the Kennedy School community yesterday, I cannot imagine the fear, sadness, and anger that you are feeling now. The pictures and stories of the Russian invasion of your country are horrifying to me and I know to people around the world for both individual people and families and for the world as a whole, this war is a terrible tragedy. I will keep the people of Ukraine in the forefront of my thoughts in the days ahead. Today, uh, we have an extraordinary opportunity to learn more about a different fundamental challenge in our world, uh, which is COVID-19, and to learn about the global response to it and very importantly, how we can build stronger health infrastructure and achieve greater health equity over time. Our distinguished guest speaker, Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, the Director General of the World Health Organization. Before joining the WHO, Dr. Tedros built a career in health and public policy in Ethiopia and globally. Dr. Tedros has a PhD in community health and worked to improve the delivery of health services first as a field level malariologist, and then as the head of a regional health service, and later as Ethiopia's Minister of Health and Minister of Foreign Affairs. As Minister of Health, he led a comprehensive reform of his country's healthcare system that committed to universal health coverage and the provision of services to all people, even in the most remote areas. Then as Minister of Foreign Affairs, Dr. Tedros elevated health as a political issue in the world. He's held many leadership positions in global health, including chair of the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria, chair of the Rollback Malaria Partnership, and co-chair of the Partnership for Maternal, Newborn, and Child Health. Dr. Tedros will be in conversation today with my friend, Dean Michelle Williams of the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Dean Williams holds the Angelopoulos Professorship in Public Health and International Development, which is a joint faculty appointment of the Harvard Chan School and the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, we need to find ways uh, to persuade Michelle to spend more time at the Kennedy School uh, with us, um, but we are uh, lucky to have her here today. Uh, Dean Williams is not only an important academic leader and award-winning educator, she is also a nationally recognized epidemiologist and public health scientist. She focuses in her own work on reproductive, perinatal, pediatric, and molecular epidemiology. She has led large scale clinical trials and published hundreds of research papers. We are very fortunate to have the chance to learn today from our distinguished guests, Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus and Dean Michelle Williams. Please join me in giving them a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dean Elmendorf, uh, my good friend. And welcome, uh, Dr. Tedros. I understand that you have some prepared remarks to share with us. But before that, I just want to also express my welcome and share with you our deepest condolences from the entire Harvard community on behalf of the the unconscionable loss of eight individuals working to vaccinate uh, children in Afghanistan against portfolio. We all stand with you in condemning the violence against public health workers. And thank you again. Over to you, Dr. Tedros. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dean Williams. Uh, thank you, my sister. And also to Dean Douglas 
Elmendorf uh, and to McNamara family, uh, students of uh, the Harvard Kennedy School and, and the School of Public Health, uh, dear colleagues and, and friends. Uh, good afternoon and thank you so much for the privilege of delivering this year's Robert McNamara Lecture. This is indeed a great honor and such a great pleasure. But I must admit that the task of delivering a lecture with war and peace in its title weighs heavily on me at a time when we are now seeing conflict in Europe of a kind we all hoped had been consigned to history. Like you, we're watching events unfold in Ukraine with deep concern for what this will mean for the region, the world, and especially for the health of the affected populations. And sadly, Ukraine is not the only conflict in our world. From Afghanistan to Myanmar, Yemen, and my own country of Ethiopia, it's an unfortunate reality that all too often conflict and this is go together. The authors of WHO's constitution were well aware of the link between health and peace, which is why they wrote in the preamble that the health of all people is fundamental to the attainment of peace and security and is dependent upon the fullest cooperation of individuals and states. Since those words were written, the world has faced many outbreaks and epidemics. Just this century, we have seen H5N1 influenza, SARS, MERS, the H1N1 pandemic, multiple Ebola outbreaks, Zika, and more. But of course, nothing much the scale of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has thrown the world into turmoil for more than two years. COVID-19 is a powerful demonstration that a pandemic is so much more than a health crisis. It illustrates the interconnectedness between health and the economy, security, education, and the intimate links between the health of humans, animals, and our planet. There are many lessons to learn about what has worked and what has not. Let me suggest five. The first is that science must, must guide policy, not the other way around. Throughout the pandemic, WHO has convened thousands of scientists from around the world to examine the rapidly emerging evidence and distill it into the guidance we give the world. Just this week, we have convened a research and innovation forum to identify the most pressing research priorities and chart the way forward. Science has given us valuable insights into how this virus spreads, how it causes disease, and how to stop it. But in some countries and communities and on social media, the marginalization and politicization of science has impeded the response to the pandemic and caused lives, politics undermining science. My point is not that science should be the only consideration in decision-making about public health. My point is that science should be the central and guiding consideration. The second lesson is that science can in fact widen inequalities unless it's paired with a commitment to equity. I'm sure that most or all of you are vaccinated. And yet as we speak, 83% of the population of Africa is yet to receive a single dose of vaccine. Vaccine nationalism, export bans, and bilateral deals between manufacturers and high-income nations severely restricted the number of doses COVAX was able to ship in the first half of last year. The supply situation has now improved, and COVAX has now been able to ship more than 1.2 billion doses of vaccine to 144 countries and territories. WHO and our partners are now working night and day to support countries to turn vaccines into vaccinations to reach our target of vaccinating 70% of the population of every country by the middle of this year. 
To reach that target, we're calling on all countries to urgently fill the ACT Accelerator's financing gap of 16 billion US dollars to ensure equitable access to vaccines, tests, and treatments, and PPE everywhere. The third lesson is that a resilient health system is not the same thing as an advanced medical care system. Even some countries with the most sophisticated medical care were overwhelmed by COVID-19. By contrast, some middle-income countries with fewer resources fared much better thanks to investments in public health after outbreaks of SARS, MERS, H1N1, and others, especially in the Mekong region. <coughs> For instance, the simple art of contact tracing is one that many high-income countries have struggled with, but it's one that many low- and middle-income countries have done well because of their experience with infectious disease outbreaks and their investments in public health. The backbone of public health is robust primary health care for detecting outbreaks at the earliest possible stage, as well as for preventing disease and promoting health at the community level. The fourth lesson is that the world needs a new agreement that sets the rules of the game for responding to epidemics and pandemics. Instead of a coherent and cohesive global response, the pandemic has been marked by a chaotic patchwork of responses, which in some cases have punished countries for doing the right thing, as in the case of the travel bans imposed on South Africa and Botswana when they first reported the emergence of the Omicron variant. And the fifth lesson is that trust is everything. A study published in The Lancet earlier this month examined the reasons why some countries have had higher rates of infection and death than others from COVID-19. The age profile of the country, GDP per capita, and mean body mass index were all found to play a part. But the researchers found that perhaps the single most important factor in countries' preparedness and ability to respond effectively is trust. The study concluded that stronger risk communication and community engagement are essential for making the world safer against future epidemics and pandemics. Vaccines, diagnostics, therapeutics, and other tools are essential, but the most effective tool is engaged and empowered communities. Science, equity, public health, cooperation, and trust. So what's being done to apply these lessons? In fact, quite a lot. There is a strong consensus that the world needs an enhanced global architecture for pandemic prevention, preparedness, and response. The recommendations of the various panels fall into four areas or pillars. First, we need stronger governance. Instead of the confusion and incoherence that has fueled this pandemic, we need cooperation and collaboration in the face of common threats. At a special session of the World Health Assembly last year, WHO's 194 member states decided to negotiate a new international instrument to provide the rules of the game for pandemic prevention, preparedness and response. Just as countries have united in the past to adapt treaties against tobacco, nuclear chemical and biological weapons, climate change and more, so now the nations of the world have made a strong statement that health security is too important to be left to chance or goodwill or shifting geopolitical currents or vested interests. Over the past two days, the Intergovernmental Negotiating Body for this new instrument or treaty held its first meeting here at WHO headquarters in Geneva. A new international accord will not solve every problem on its own, but it will provide an essential overarching framework, the rules of the game for a more coordinated and harmonized response to future epidemics and pandemics, above all, obligations from countries. Second, we need stronger financing. It's obvious that nationally and globally, we need substantial resources for strengthening global health security. Our analysis estimates the needs at 31 billion US dollars per year. 
to close the gap for the most essential functions, such as surveillance, research, and market shaping for countermeasures, we support the idea of a new dedicated financing facility anchored in and directed by WHO's constitutional mandate, inclusive governance, and technical expertise. Third, we need stronger systems and tools to prevent, detect, and respond rapidly to epidemics and pandemics. Already WHO has taken steps to build some of these systems and tools. To strengthen surveillance, we have established the WHO Hub for Pandemic and Epidemic Intelligence in Berlin to harness the power of collaborative and artificial intelligence and other cutting edge technologies to facilitate greater sharing of pathogens and clinical samples. We're piloting the WHO biohub system based at a source facility in Switzerland to improve mutual accountability, solidarity and cooperation between countries. We are piloting the universal health and preparedness review a new peer review mechanism for enhancing national preparedness based on the gaps identified to improve and strengthen national capacity. And to strengthen capacities for local production of vaccines and other health products in low and middle income countries, we have established the WHO Technology Transfer Hub in South Africa, which has already developed its own mRNA COVID-19 vaccine candidate. The choice for South Africa is because the greatest gap is in Africa. Of course, the South Africa mRNA hub will serve Africa and the rest of the world. And fourth, we need to understand how this pandemic started. We owe it to those who have died and their families to do our best to identify where this coronavirus came from. It's important to understand that WHO does not have a mandate to investigate outbreaks on its own. Our role is to conduct joint studies with affected countries at their invitation, especially with the negotiation of the member states. I hope this will improve and WHO will have a mandate to investigate. That's what we did in China last year, joint studies. Every hypothesis remains on the table and we're continuing to make progress but we have also experienced setbacks in sharing of data, especially lab records. Just last month, I met with Premier Li in Beijing during my visit to China for the opening of the Winter Olympic Games. We discussed the need to advance studies into the origins of the virus, including those relating to a potential lab accident. To establish a more systematic way of identifying the origins of future outbreaks, we have established the scientific advisory group for the origins of novel pathogens or SEGO. There is much more that could be said about each of these areas. And I look forward to our discussion over the next 45 minutes. Above all, the COVID-19 pandemic <coughs> reminds us that health is not simply a luxury for the rich. It's a, fundament, it's a fundamental human right, but it's also a right that not everyone enjoys equally. Last week, the world lost one of its foremost public health professionals, my good friend, Paul Farmer. Paul was one of Harvard's most distinguished alumni holding an MD and a PhD and was the Colotron's University Professor and Chair of the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School. Paul passed in his sleep in Rwanda, where he was doing what he loved to do, supporting medical education at a district hospital. He was a great humanitarian and a tireless champion of equity and health as a human right. Paul once asked, if access to healthcare is considered a human right, who is considered human enough to have that right? It's that right that I and the thousands of people I'm honored to call my colleagues work for every day. Not health for some, not health for most, health for all. Michelle? Thank you and back to you.
Thank you so much, Dr. Tedros. And thank you for remembering and reflecting on the tremendous contributions of our dear friend, Paul Farmer, 